It's okay. I don't know. I never met him. No, no. <laughs> okay, it's about 10:30. I said we'd open it up for questions at this point. So. Okay, so you know I want to get involved, but I just don't have a lot of time. And what I really need is a real small step, you know, baby steps. And I don't know if you guys are like designing baby steps for us to try out as, you know, I've got plenty of programming, I've got experience and stuff like that, but I just don't know enough about your particular project. As a could developer? You, well, you know, as a contributor, I could do documentation, whatever. So small projects, is there? So, so GNOME has uh, what, what's called uh, low-hanging fruit, and it's in, the, if you go to GNOME Love, there's, uh, there should be, I, I haven't actually looked at the website in a while, but there was always a, a nice, nice list of known issues that are simple, easy fixes, that if you just want to come in and, and fix this or that and work and do a little bit, there's a list of stuff that we know needs done and that's fairly simple. Um, and that if you, want, if you need help, we can walk you through it, uh, which I think has been helpful. Uh, I know that there's that for the outreach program from which I do believe just as of this round or maybe next round is outreachy and it has expanded to everyone. Um, I'm still a firm believer in that we need an outreach program to kids is what we really need to, to expand into and pull kids in. There's also a site called OpenHash that has similar stuff that they call the bite-sized bugs and uh, any project can go list there. You know what, we got these 20 things that we would like somebody to do, but nobody's ever going to get around to, but it would be really easy for you to do, so they list them there. Yeah, there's a couple, there's a couple other things that I tell people to do. Um, one is uh, go to an ask.whatever site, if there's an ask site. It's a really good way to go through and look at a lot of other questions that people have posed, see if any of them are things you think you know the answer to, or things you think you can find the answer to relatively quickly on your own with your own skills, that they might not have the skills to come up with that answer. Um, that usually is a good 15 to 30 to an hour uh, snippet of getting more involved in, in the process, learning more about how things work. The other thing I tell people to do is to find the Getting Started documentation and actually walk all the way through it and see if it's still accurate. Because nine times out of ten, you'll find there's one minor change that is worth mentioning there that you can point out and say, hey, I was following the Getting Started docs and I got to step nine and it looks like it should be accurate this instead of that. That's a big thing with uh, Open Document Foundation, Documenting Labor Office. We're always looking for people who will just take a chapter of the documentation and just go through it step by step. You know, if you have the software in front of you and you say, yeah, that works the way you said it did. <laughs> or, no, it doesn't, or, actually. Or no, it doesn't. <laughs> so occasionally, I've been able to report back and say, you know, this stuff doesn't work. I don't know if it was updated the last time or not. I, yeah. <clears throat> uh, oh, yeah, it's a regression. You know, we thought we'd fixed it, but we just brought it back again. <laughs> Oops. And I concur with any, I mean, the users list, too. Um, just if there's, there's a question or two that we were asked in the last few days. Yeah, maybe you, you have an answer. But the bug track, I mean, really on any project, whether they have the sophisticated low hanging fruit or whether there might even be a bug tag specifically for low hanging fruit, we, we all call it the same thing. Um, these are all typically fairly small, bite sized pieces. But yeah, use the bug track. Just look, and, and more to the point, find the bugs that actually interest you, right? Because if you, if you only have, first of all, if you're getting involved in, in there's got to be something wrong already that you've encountered. Um, Maybe you're not up to tackling it quite yet, but find something related to it, you know, to that part of the code. Because if you, if you start playing in that piece of it, at some point you're going to become savvy enough to actually fix that underlying bug that really, really bothers you. And, you know, speaking of bugs, Tom touched on this, but you know, a good bug report is more than like, oh, well, I tried this, it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know I, what, when, when I think something isn't working, I, I try and do step by step. I open to the program. This is what I clicked on. This menu came up. I clicked that. And, you know, step by step, what happened? And I did it on this computer with this operating system, blah, 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 because that's what the developers need to really make any sense out of the bug report. Pretend you are a CSI technician on a television show. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, tell me everything about your system, tell me everything about what was nearby, tell me everything about what was happening in the same environment, uh, tell me things you don't think I need to know, because that might be important. The car was fancy <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, be as specific as you can, and then the follow-up thing is, if you can generate a, it always happens when I do this, 
that is super helpful in a bug report. Even if I can't make it do that when I do this, at least I have some path to try to trace down and say, okay, it probably is in that side of the code. Um, I'm sorry. Release candidates. I like certain Linuxes, and I can't wait for the next version to come out. But they're looking for people for, to test. Um, is it? Do they usually? And I think well, other people are testing that. That's fine. But is it really helpful if more people? Yeah. Is yeah. it good to help mm -hmm. just everyday average guy? Absolutely. Yeah. You use That's cases. Good you use cases unique in some. Way. I don't know what way it is, but in some way your use case is unique. Run it through all the things you want to work so that when we do the release, you'll have a very good idea that those things work. You can assume that everyone is booting it. Beyond that, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I run, like I say, I run Ubuntu, so um, I do believe 15.04 was just officially released yesterday. I've been on 15.04 since, I don't know, sometime in the fall. Essentially, when the first beta came out, I reinstall every couple months is what I end up doing, just because I'm changing versions or switching to different distro or whatever. But I'm almost always on a beta distro. So I should sit bugs. there and complain about yes. features that are wrong. I yes. should help them. Yeah. Just, or just just yeah. complaining that this crashed when I did this is helpful. But I should instead of just complaining myself. I should let people yes. know. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah. Software and complain about it. Yeah. All <laughs> A lesson I learned a long time ago from the former Red Hat CEO was that you should never complain out loud unless you have a, a proposed solution to fix it. Oh. I, I think, I just want to jump in here quickly on this type of thing because um, I just wonder what, whether various projects have, um, have really established um, the, a, a really good, clear bug reporting procedure because I mean, I know what to do because of my, you know, my background in software, that type of thing. I know you really want our steps to replicate, blah, blah, blah. But I think for just regular users who come across something, a lot of times they'll say, oh, that doesn't work, and they move on to something else. Um, but with maybe a, a way to, so they understand how to report a bug in a very clear yet simple way. There are better ones, and there are certainly some really horrible ones. Um, better ones, I'm thinking of Chrome. Um, last time I had a report a bug there, um, it was bullet by bullet, you know, ten, 10 things to answer, 10 questions to answer or something. Um, you know, some projects, I guess, because like I said, part, some of the things I work on are infrastructure, so these folks already kind of have a handle on how to do a bug report. That doesn't mean we don't get bad ones, but they tend to come in without all the guiding prompts. But I think when you get into GUI, yeah. user interface stuff, you, it's, it is, it's partly on us to, yeah. to do a better job of asking, you know, guiding a bug report. But with Ubuntu, when a lot of things, when core parts of the system crash, it actually prompts you to say, do you want to report this bug? And you, just by clicking yes, then there's a form that you can fill out and tell me more and bits and pieces. Especially, I think, release candidates or, right. or beta versions where if somebody's going to go and test their use case, that right. there is on the desktop a little form reporting thing that, that when they that's tell a great idea. you click it, and then here's, here's the form, you send it off or you submit it. And right. So Ubuntu has had some local bug hunt events prior in prior releases. I don't think they had one this time. But, you know, so they basically get a bunch of people in a room and try it out on a bunch of equipment. And they have somebody there who can walk you through the process of filing the bug mm -hmm. report. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, really helps getting a couple people to understand how to do that. And they can sort of help out in that way. And I I'm, I'm, guess the other question I have is, so the rig that you use, I mean, it's useful to have a rig where you know everything and know all about it and everything. And I'm thinking maybe like virtual machines to do different testing and, and you know, it's good to, you know, do it on several different machines to see if it, it's propagating through different environments. Um, what kind of rigs are you guys running to, to do your development? And um, I guess I can start. Uh, I, let's see here, I, I myself have a, a, just a laptop that I, I use, and I just play on mostly and report books as I find them. Um, I also have, well, I will soon have two desktops running that are basically my boys' computers. They're also my backups that if mine completely dies and I can't fix it, I can pop on theirs. <laughs> um, and my husband has a laptop that's actually identical to mine, and he's, I do believe he's on, sh on Ubuntu 14.04. I, I keep all of them on the last long-term release candidates so that it works for them, and 90% of the time they're, they're fine. Um, and then I can 
play on mine and, and break things at will. <laughs> I was just going to laugh. Um, the, the laptop over there has uh, got um, nine or ten different VMs right now. And, uh, uh, unfortunately, I can't do anything on uh, Cube like Docker or whatever. It's everywhere from Solaris to three bleak, three uh, versions of Windows and um, four versions of, you know, of Linux and Solaris x86. So, but I, I think, I think that, yeah, it does. It really does. I, I think one of the sad part bits, though, is, is that when you ask, what kind of rigs are we running? I think that's the important point. It comes back to the question you ask. Yes, test. I mean, yes, participate. Because we don't have. I mean, we're, we're, we're a dozen developers on a given project. There's no way our machines could represent everything that everywhere it's going to be rolled out. And, and with every combination. That's the other thing that I, I got a kick out of is, when you're building a kernel or something, or you're dealing with uh, the Apache Web Server where all of these loadable modules might be there and they might be absent and everybody is trying to accomplish something different. Nothing beats the array of different environments, different unique uh, scenarios that, that uh, exist So if, if, if I tend to have, and I've got a history of using old, old computers, you know, so I if I keep ones. having the same problem over and over with different systems and all this, it's possible that developers have never even seen this problem because they've got their own machines. Absolutely. That's what uh, one of my, my boys' computers is. Let's see here. It was my high school graduation present, so it's from 2002. And it still runs Ubuntu just fine. Um, and so my five-year-old, he mostly they mostly just play Flash games online. So that works for them just fine. Um, it also works as a great backup and a server for me. And, and, but I think that's a great point, that a lot of the older hardware, a lot of developers just don't use. Which would explain why certain bugs that I personally have right. never get fixed. When right. I see them. So I right. should open my mouth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Open your mouth and tell people when you have issues. Uh, don't assume someone else is looking at it. That's how the hard plea thing got out of hand. <laughs> Everyone thought someone else was looking at it. It's open source. Right. Many eyeballs. How can there be a problem? And it turned out, well, no one was actually looking at the code. The only thing I'd say to that is before you sit there and open your mouth, search first. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, and if you're running old hardware, run a memory tester before you follow up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, run a what? Memory tester. 99% yeah. of that. It does this weird thing on my ancient 10 year old equipment. Your memory is failing. Yeah. That's why it's being weird. <laughs> Yeah. And when you do open your mouth, please do it politely. Oh well, yeah, I have yeah. some of the... Yeah, but someone trying to ask a question here? Yeah. Do you think that the email lists are effectively a, a form to keep out, out the riffraff in some developers' eyes? Because every time I look at an email list, it's like, I'm going to add that much more list to my, work to my email. To keep no. them out or invite them yeah. in? No. no. It's like when I look at an email list, I'm like, I don't want to deal with that. Oh, you mean you think mailing lists exist to push you away as a contributor? It, and it adds more work to an email to me. I, 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 kind of, I think I know what you're saying, which is that a, a mailing list, if that's the only way to start contributing, or that's the primary way to start, to start contributing, it's definitely a major, mm -hmm. a major step to, for me to say to this group of hundreds or thousands of people that I've never met, I have this problem. How are they going to respond? Are they going to respond, especially if I'm reading through the archives and there's all these other people who've been flamed, why am I going to bother? It, it's a major hurdle, a major roadblock to contributing, especially, like they say, if that's the main way to start, that's a horrible way to go about it. I don't, I don't know that I agree with that entirely. I, don't, I, don't, I certainly don't think that any project puts up a mailing list because they don't want people no. Uh, and, I, and I think that I've seen plenty of forums where every time I look at the forum, it's just flames in response. And so I think that the problem of people misbehaving, people being dicks on the internet, is independent of the forum's communication. Yeah. Uh, I don't, and I don't, I don't even think I would argue that mailing lists lend themselves more to that. I think it literally is just, do you want a push or a pull relationship with this community? Yeah. And if you want one, then there's mailing lists. If you don't want the other one, then there's forums. And a healthy community will try to have both. A healthy community try to have mailing lists segmented so it's not just fire hose it's users developers testers marketing broken down into those categories uh, so I think it, it, it's really going to be sort of 
when you, you look at a mailing list and you're like, man, this is, there's one mailing list, there's too much traffic, everyone's getting flamed, that's not a mailing list problem, that's a community problem. That might be a community you don't want to be part of anyways. Well, and when you said to keep the riffraff out, that's what I heard was I thought you meant like the obnoxious, rude, and or generally mean people. I'm like, no, we got plenty of those on mailing lists. <laughs> <laughs> So 
hearing my other talk is at one, and it is not at all Linux related. It's about details in your costuming, and then I'll be judging the costume contest tonight. Cool. All right. I, I have one question. This is going to sound like a pretty dumb question. <laughs> now, I heard you refer to a certain desktop environment as GNOME. I heard you call it GNOME. What is the official? Uh, I, I think that it's officially GNOME, and is then it? and because I've said GNOME. I mean, I've, I've said it, that it's way. it's pronouncing the G for GNU. Okay, it is what the okay. The Similarly, when the the CentOS team joined Red Hat, I I realized suddenly that they were all pronouncing it different ways. Some of them said CentOS, some of them said CentOS. I think some of them said Sunshine. I don't know. <laughs> Right way, they're like, I don't, I don't know. We just, whatever. <laughs> 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 so I, 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 I,